Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Janet Jalil, and in the early hours of Friday the 12th of January, these are our main stories. The British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has held talks with his cabinet to discuss potential US and UK strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, says hypocrisy and lies are behind the court case at The Hague, in which his country is accused of committing genocide in Gaza. Researchers say they've found the ruins of a vast ancient city in the Ecuadorian Amazon that changes everything known about the history of the region. Also in this podcast... One of my vendors was selling something else and she said at the end of the conversation, I've got a couple of friend scripts, do you think they'll sell? And I of course went, yes, yes, bring them in, bring them in because I love friends. 25 years after they were thrown in a bin, original scripts from the hit US sitcom are up for auction. As we record this podcast, expectations are rising that the United States and Britain are preparing to carry out airstrikes on Iranian-backed rebels in Yemen, possibly in the coming hours. On Thursday evening, the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, briefed his cabinet as well as the leader of the opposition. The Times of London newspaper said he dispensed with the usual convention of informing the British Parliament because the airstrikes were expected within hours. Another briefing has been taking place in Washington. In recent days, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen have been stepping up attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea in what they say is a protest against Israel's war in Gaza. This is despite the deployment of a US-led naval task force in the region. On Wednesday, after British and US warships were repelled the largest Houthi rebel attack to date. The British Defence Minister, Grant Shapps, said he had no doubt whatsoever that Iran was behind it. We do know that Iran is behind so much of, I'm afraid, the bad things that are happening in that region. And uh, uh, there have been reports, I've seen them on social media, media as well, about how Iran are providing effectively the eyes and the ears, the radar systems through ships and other things, and certainly the equipment to the Houthis who are using it to attack shipping. This all comes as the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, wrapped up his latest Middle East tour aimed at stopping the conflict there escalating. Just before we recorded this podcast, our U.S. State Department correspondent, Tom Bateman, gave us this update. The last 48 hours, I think, have seen a sense that something is imminent. That's come from both sides of the Atlantic. But particularly tonight, it is because the UK government has been meeting virtually in a conference call uh, to discuss this very issue about Yemen. They called in opposition leaders and now the Pentagon in the last couple of hours, Major General Patrick Ryder, the spokesman there, was asked repeatedly about whether something was imminent. He said he wasn't going to speculate but he repeated the message that we've heard multiple times over the last two days now that they say there will be consequences for the Houthis over these attacks in the Red Sea. And this has really become uh, an issue over the last fortnight in particular because we had this lethal moment just before the turn of the new year uh, when there was an attempt by the Houthis, according to the U.S. account, to hijack a container ship. Uh, a, a U.S. attack then sunk uh, three fast boats belonging to the Houthis, killing 10 of the militiamen, according to the group itself. They said in response to that, on Tuesday this week, they launched this uh, wave of drone and ballistic and cruise missile attacks against shipping in the Red Sea. And it was after that that we had particularly the US and the UK warning that there would be consequences. And what are the likely targets? How would this work? Well, I think what will be significant if if there is an attack on land that hasn't happened so far, particularly against um, Houthi bases, now, the, the, the key issue for the U.S. here is we've had over the last week Secretary of State Anthony Blinken uh, touring the region, his fourth official tour visit uh, since the October 7th attacks. And one of the key messages has remained they don't want an escalation. And yet it seems we are on the verge of a, uh, you know, Western-based U.S.-led attack possibly against Houthi infrastructure in Yemen. Tom Bateman. With more on the risks that the West faces in carrying out strikes on the Houthi rebels, here's our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. All these warnings were meant to scare the Houthis into stopping their attacks. 
That hasn't worked. So if they don't do anything, then the West looks weak. What is the point in having a great big US-led armada down in the Red Sea with guided missile destroyers and an aircraft carrier if it doesn't do anything? But if they do hit the Houthi positions, then there is the risk that this will be portrayed throughout the Middle East as the US and Britain and their allies joining in the Gaza war on Israel's side. And it will be portrayed as such. People will die, almost certainly, and they will be called martyrs. It will play very well domestically at home. The risk for governments in the region is that this could generate popular unrest and it could ignite and metastasize the entire Middle East tension into something much bigger than it was. That's why they've been hesitating up until now. Frank Gardner. With Britain expected to join the US in conducting airstrikes on military positions belonging to the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, our political editor, Chris Mason, told us more about the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's specially convened cabinet meeting. That cabinet call was a conference call in which it would appear the Prime Minister was briefing the cabinet on the prospect of UK military action that will be imminent in and around the Red Sea. Shortly after that cabinet call, we saw in person arriving on foot John Healy, the Shadow Defence Secretary for Labour, and also Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the leader of the Commons, arriving. We also saw the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, going into Downing Street. And the expectation in situations like this where time allows is that senior opposition figures such as Keir Starmer, who we think has probably joined a call to be briefed as well, as well as the Shadow Defence Secretary and the Commons Speaker, would be briefed. The UK government always has the capacity to respond without consulting either the opposition or wider parliaments, but convention would normally point in the direction of that happening when it could. The fact that that has happened uh, paints a pretty clear picture, I think, that we can expect UK involvement in military strikes against the Houthis imminently if the UK, alongside its allies, determines that those strikes should happen. If we take a little bit of a step back, there is real concern, and there has been concern for some time, about the impact on commercial shipping through the Red Sea, such was the concern about how dangerous that passage had become. The additional costs that are associated with boats travelling all the way around the base of Africa to complete the same journey, as well as obvious concerns at every level, whether it be military, diplomatic, economic, of any escalation in conflict in the Middle East, with the knock-ons, huge knock-ons that that would have or could have in the region, but much more widely economically as well. Chris Mason. Israel's Prime Minister has described accusations of genocide against his government as being based on hypocrisy and lies. Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking after South Africa, whose ANC government has long supported the Palestinian cause, outlined its case to the UN's top court, alleging that Israel's military offensive in Gaza amounts to genocide. Mr Netanyahu said listening to the first day of arguments in The Hague was like being in an upside-down world. He insisted that his country was in fact battling genocide by Hamas after the massacres of October the 7th. A terrorist organization committed the most terrible crime against the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and now there are those who come to defend it in the name of the Holocaust. What audacity! But lawyers for South Africa told the International Court of Justice in The Hague that Israel was acting with genocidal intent. According to Hamas officials, the war has killed 1% of the population of Gaza in three months. The South African Justice Minister, Ronald Lamola, accused Israel of intentionally unleashing suffering on civilians in the Gaza Strip. The world is watching in horror as Palestinian men, women and children were slaughtered, blown up, buried alive under the rubble of their homes, left to die painful deaths and in unresourced hospitals, resulting in over 23,000 deaths through destruction to homes, schools, hospitals, water, treatment plants and other public infrastructure. The Genocide Convention was enacted in 1948 in the wake of the Holocaust. It defines genocide as acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. Our diplomatic correspondent Paul Adams considers whether South Africa will be able to prove that Israel's offensive in Gaza meets that threshold. 
The last three months have been shocking enough, but to hear it all summed up by South Africa's lawyers is still devastating. How, many wonder, can this not be a story of genocide? But the 1948 definition, which so accurately describes the horrors of the Holocaust that had so recently ended, is an incredibly high bar to clear. The South African team knows it has a legal mountain to climb. There has to be evidence of intent by those responsible for Israel's military campaign. And there has to be a pattern of behaviour by its troops which cannot reasonably be explained as anything other than genocidal. Israel will make its case. Its high-powered delegation includes Aharon Barak, Israel's former chief justice, and himself a Holocaust survivor. The implication, perhaps, Israel understands the true face of genocide. It'll be three or four years before the court decides whether Israel is guilty. But much sooner than that, perhaps within weeks, it could demand that Israel halt its military campaign to avoid inflicting further harm on Palestinian civilians. Israel, determined to pursue its goal of destroying Hamas as a political and military force, would almost certainly ignore the court's ruling. There's nothing the ICJ can do to enforce it. But a judgment by the UN's top legal authority could add to the pressure mounting on Israel to change the way it acts in Gaza. Paul Adams. Many of those killed in Gaza have been children. The Hamas-run health ministry says 40% of those who've died have been under the age of 18. But even before the current war, those growing up in Gaza had lived through multiple rounds of fighting between Palestinian armed groups in Israel. Back in 2021, the BBC reported on a girl called Nadine Abdul Latif. Now 13, she's become a popular vlogger and has been describing how during this conflict, her brother was killed during an Israeli airstrike and her family forced from their home. Here's our BBC Middle East correspondent, Yolanda Nell. That is the sound we hear every night. Did you hear that? Hunkered down in her apartment, this was an Instagram video by Nadine Abdul Latif in the early days of the war. The block around us is being attacked. We don't know which building is going to be under uh, attack, but um, a lot of people out in the streets are screaming and we are not sure what's going to happen. She filmed her world being shattered her neighborhood of Gaza City, pounded by Israeli bombs. This is my home. This is my home. Look how it looks like now. Soon, like hundreds of thousands of others, she was forced to flee towards the south. We've left our houses three times, from Gaza to al and to al to Rafah. Now, Nadine tells me of her own terrible loss in this war. Losing my brother was the worst moment of my life. I mean, he was my dear brother. He was everything that I loved. He was always by my side. We would always go out together. Out there from the war, I just want you to stop. During a previous conflict in 2021, school was cancelled and Nadine began making videos for social media. One clip of her, distraught by the rubble of her neighbor's house, went viral. I don't know what to do. I'm just dead. I'm just 10. Children stand all day and wait for them to be able to get water for their families. Again, during the three long months of this war, Nadine's been showing the trauma and struggle for children who make up half of the 2.3 million people in Gaza. I saw these two children selling cans of food in the rain. They might get sick, but this is our life. And there are the daily indignities. As you guys can see, I'm still in the same clothes because there is no water. I can't take a shower. Nadine's long hoped to be a doctor, but now she can barely contemplate the future. It's not living anymore, just existing. We don't have hopes anymore. We don't don't go to school. We don't do anything. We just sit here and watch and do the stuff. Just exist. And that is horrible. Every day feels dangerous in Gaza. And with so much grief and devastation, even when the violence stops, its young generation will find it hard to pick up the pieces of their lives. Yoland Nell. The former US President Donald Trump has reiterated his belief that his civil fraud case is a political witch hunt on the closing day of the trial in New York. Mr. Trump has already been found guilty of inflating the value of his properties to secure favourable loans. The trial is looking at other counts such as conspiracy and falsification of business records. 
Our North America correspondent, Neda Torfik, sent this report from outside the court. In court, Donald Trump's lawyer echoed the former president's claims. Chris Keiss said the case had been manufactured for political reasons and that the attorney general was trying to put Mr. Trump out of business. He argued that the accusations didn't make sense because Deutsche Bank had rolled out the red carpet to give Mr. Trump loans, that he didn't need to inflate the worth of his assets, and the loans were paid back. The judge has banned Mr. Trump from addressing the court himself because he's failed to agree to limits on what he could say. So the former president made a statement outside. It's a witch hunt in the truest sense of the word. It's election interference. And so it's all it's all a conspiracy to try and get Biden, who can't put two sentences together, trying to get him into office. So I just want to let you know that we have our best poll numbers. We have the best everything despite this and maybe because of this, because the people of the United States, all of those people back there, But the people of the United States really get it. They get it better than anybody else. Judge has previously disagreed with the defense. He said lenders could have been damaged by lending at a lower interest rate than they would have if Mr. Trump's assets had been valued correctly. Prosecutors argue that the former president used a myriad of deceptive schemes that were so outrageous they belied innocent explanation. The judge will issue a verdict at a later date. Neda Torfik. Now to the tiny, unspoilt Caribbean island of Barbuda. Some residents there fear that the arrival of new multi-million dollar tourist resorts and an international airport will threaten their culture and way of life. Others see them as bringing much-needed jobs and development. Caroline Bailey has been to Barbuda, the smaller of the two island states of Antigua and Barbuda, to find out what the future holds for this island paradise. From a beautiful pink sandy beach, environmentalist John Mussington points out two private resorts at either end of Barbuda's southern coast. It's known as the Barbuda Ocean Club, and they're building hundreds of multi-million dollar residences and a golf course. Luxury properties are built, golf courses are going to be built. Sale of these luxury properties and put them behind fence for persons living private lifestyle will mean large areas of resources we depend on for livelihoods will no longer be available to us. John is worried about the environmental impact as the larger of the two resorts is within an area declared by the intergovernmental Ramsar Convention as a wetland of international significance. The developers leading the project, the American firms PLH Barbuda Limited and the Discovery Land Company, declined our request for an interview but said in a statement that the project was approved in a transparent and inclusive process and that they're doing a lot of environmental work, including restoring wetlands, and also that they've created hundreds of jobs for Barbudans. But John has taken the government to court over another aspect of the project, the construction of an airport in the middle of the island, which he says is in an environmentally sensitive area. No proper environmental impact assessment was done. And when an impact assessment turned up, the review by the Department of Environment said it was totally inadequate. The case has been heard at the Privy Council in London, Antigua and Barbuda's highest court. If John wins, he'll have the right, that's been denied to him, to challenge the project and call for a judicial review, where a judge would look at the lawfulness of the process. But others, like local businesswoman Kelsina George, who runs Barbuda Cottages, see the high-end resorts as good for the island's economy. They've hired a lot of Barbudans, all the young people, everyone went to work there. And from what I gather, they're pretty happy with the money. And that's what the government based in Antigua says is the priority. Charles Fernandez is the Tourism and Investment Minister. Well, I think it's the vision of the government to bring Barbuda to a level where it has full employment. Barbuda is going to generate, when it's uh, fully operational, is going to generate a tremendous amount in taxes. Barbuda is not alone. Around the world, there are similar battles taking place as small paradise communities in beautiful locations attempt to balance economic need against protecting their own cultures. Caroline Bailey reporting from the Caribbean island of Barbuda. Still to come, scientists use both excavations and ground-penetrating lasers to find these vast remains in the Amazonian rainforest in eastern Ecuador. The huge ancient city, believed to have been built 
two and a half thousand years ago. Some people play golf on the weekends. I hunt con artists. Unmissable podcasts from the BBC World Service. Are County Mayo a great team blighted by mystical forces we can't comprehend? I believe in the curse. I think it's real. Telling stories from around the globe. Every minute there's bombing and shelling. There is no safety. If I get any internet connection, I'll talk to you again. Search for Lives Less Ordinary, Amazing Sports Stories, and The Documentary, wherever you get your BBC podcasts. You better be ready, because I'm going to bring it to you. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Tens of thousands of opposition supporters have held an anti-government demonstration in the Polish capital, Warsaw. The rally outside Parliament was called by the Law and Justice Party, which lost elections last October. The demonstrators were protesting against the new government's imprisonment of two former ministers who've been convicted of abusing their powers when they headed an anti-corruption agency. President Andrzej Duda had pardoned the men for the crimes in 2015. But last year, the Supreme Court ruled the pardon was invalid, something the president disputes. As Adam Easton reports from Warsaw, he's now started the process to once again pardon the two men. Tusk to prison, the demonstrators chanted. They mean Donald Tusk, the country's new prime minister and political enemy number one of opposition law and justice supporters. Many of them are angry about the way Mr Tusk has started undoing the controversial reforms of the law and justice government that recently lost power after eight years in office. I am a Pole and I think what's happening harms Poland and is illegal. Above all, taking over public television and imprisoning people who have parliamentary immunity and forcing the president to pardon them again. She's talking about Mariusz Kaminski and Maciej Wonsik, who were convicted last month of abusing their powers when they led an anti-corruption agency. After a court ordered police to take them into custody earlier this week, they briefly sheltered in the presidential palace at President Duda's invitation. President Duda refused to recognise the court ruling, saying he'd already pardoned the men for the crimes. But his original pardon was legally disputed. As the men said they were starting a hunger strike in prison, President Duda said he would issue a fresh pardon to allow them to be released. Adam Easton in Poland. The jailed Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has long complained of the harsh treatment he receives in prison, being frequently put in a punishment cell, being denied access to medical treatment and even attempts to poison him. So his supporters were alarmed when he disappeared for several weeks at the end of last year. They eventually tracked him to a remote penal colony in the Russian Arctic. This week, in his first public appearance since then, he's told a Supreme Court judge by video link that he should be allowed access to proper meal breaks and more books in prison. You, comrade, said that I have ten books, and there are religious books among those ten books. I need two books for the constant practice of my religion. My religion is Orthodox Christianity. And any representative of the Orthodox religion will tell you that more than one book is needed for daily practice. One book is not enough for me. This violates my religious rights. It violates my rights to study. I asked our Russia analyst Vitaly Shevchenko how Mr. Navalny appeared during the court hearing. Well, he looked haggard, which is not surprising given the circumstances, but also both when he appeared via video link from his Arctic colony on Wednesday and today and Thursday, he looked upbeat, he was smiling, he made some jokes, which of course will be a source of inspiration to his followers and supporters. And also it will ease the concerns and fears which emerged after Mr. Navalny disappeared in early December and none of his lawyers and supporters knew where he was. So he's back. He is reasonably well as far as we can tell. He is able to continue to argue his cases in court. So today his case was focused on prison rules such as the limit on the number of books inmates can have in their cells. And also, he complained against 
a prison rule which said that you have only a certain amount of time to consume your hot meals. And according to him, that amount of time in practical terms was usually reduced to 15 minutes. And he said that inmates burned themselves because they were in such a hurry to eat their meals. And unsurprisingly, those complaints were rejected. So he's been able to achieve very little with his cases, but at least he's trying. And he's also showing them that he remains defiant, that the Russian authorities and these draconian conditions that he's been kept in have not broken him. Which I suppose is the reason why he was sent to jail in the first place. Mr Navalny is arguably Russia's most active, prominent and effective opposition figure. And now he's in jail, which means that President Putin is the only man on the top who will be able to run for re-election later this year. All of his effective and credible opponents are either in jail, such as Mr Navalny, or in exile, such as almost all of Mr Navalny's supporters, or dead, such as Boris Nemtsov, who was shot dead outside the Kremlin. Vitaly Shevchenko. The Thai government says it will continue to allow a former prime minister who's supposed to be in jail to serve his sentence in hospital. Officials said Taksin Shinawat still needed close medical attention. Mickey Bristow reports. The billionaire businessman was initially sent to prison when he returned to Thailand from self-imposed exile last August. The 74-year-old was almost immediately transferred to hospital, complaining of tightness in his chest. The government, run by a political party linked to Mr Taksin, says he can stay at the luxury medical facility just in case he needs treatment. The former PM is serving a one-year jail term and is eligible for parole next month, so he might never see the inside of a prison cell again. Mickey Bristow. Now, cast your mind back to some of the supply chain problems during the COVID-19 pandemic. A key concern was the availability of semiconductors, those computer chips so vital for many of our electronic items. Well, since the pandemic, geopolitical tensions have also affected this industry with 90% of the world's most advanced chips made by TSMC in Taiwan. So it will come as no surprise that countries all over the world are now investing billions of dollars to try to make their own supply. Hannah Mullane visited a new factory near the city of Durham in northern England. There she met David Moore, the chief executive of the Pragmatic Semiconductor Company. We get started? Yeah, let's start it. Okay. Let's go to these five. First, I had to put my safety gear on. Yeah. Does it matter that I can't put my helmet on my head with these headphones on? Um... You can get me a, a very large one. After we managed to find a helmet big enough to accommodate my head and my headphones, we were ready to go. Well, welcome again. So this is Pragmatic Park. This is Pragmatic's newest manufacturing site for flexible integrated circuit technologies. So unlike silicon, we make what is a ultra-thin, very flexible, low-cost, sustainable alternative to those silicon chips. These are essentially eight inches wide, and so they've got a certain number of chips to it. You can see the tiny little rectangles there. Each of those is a chip. And so what's really special about it is that it's flexible. Yeah, and I'm feeling it, and it feels like the kind of film I might wrap a Christmas gift in or something. Yes, yes, you could. It's really, very Right, right, for those 